What you're about to hear are five episodes of my new podcast, Tales from the Break Room, where people send me scary workplace stories and I narrate them. Please, if you like what you hear, follow and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app to help us grow. Thank you. Links in the description. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Break time again already, huh? Gee, time sure flies when your customers keep complaining about that corpsey taste in their cold brew. <laughs> corpsey. Uh, that might actually explain where our last employee's finger went after the bagel cutting incident. Remind me to check the cold brew machine later. Anyway, I do have a couple of new stories from listeners to share. One of them is a very good reason why working from home can be just as, if not more, creepy than working on site. The other story tells of a walk home alone from work and what sorts of unseen terrors await you in the dark. Enjoy, and do remember, if you ever decide to clock back in, you may never clock out. These are Tales from the Break Room. I can come in from Awaken O Sleeper. This may not be conventional, but my personal line of work is being a housewife, and I do work from home as well. I've thought about submitting my personal horror stories often, and I do have quite a few, but this one always was just one of the most sickeningly creepy stories I've experienced. At the time, I was 21, newly married and also a couple months pregnant. My husband and I had been in a car accident and had no car at the time, so he normally commuted to work with his co-workers while I just stayed in our tiny one-bedroom apartment all day and worked from my laptop. When we first moved in, the walls were bland and white. Luckily enough, the landlord gave me permission to paint, so I got a few basic supplies like paint, brushes, and putty for any nicks that I found along the way. But I ended up not even needing the putty, as the walls were in good condition. I was excited to finally be on my own with my husband, and not long after we moved in, I met our neighbor and his wife. He was a middle-aged, beer-gut, and balding man, with that band of hair that wraps around his head. I'm not sure what it's called, but he was very friendly nonetheless, while his wife was an average lady about the same age, brunette with glasses and uncomfortably quiet and distant. I was polite, regardless, and tried to make small talk with her but she was more interested in going back inside than having conversations with me, while her husband, we'll call him Bill, on the other hand, was very engaged in trying to make small talk with me. He asked me the basics, I suppose, how old I was, where I was from, what I did for a living. I answered truthfully as anyone would when meeting a new neighbor. I thought it would be a good idea to make good with the neighbors seeing as I would be alone most of the time without a vehicle and wanted to have people nearby that I could reach out to in case of emergencies. So far, the neighbors above me were three nutjob sign-waving fanatics that would make it a point to inform others that God hates particular types of people, and the neighbors to the right of me constantly were yelling and screaming. So, really, I didn't want to associate with either group. Mr. Bill seemed to be the nicest man, so I didn't mind the occasional conversation with him. While chatting on our first meeting, he asked me if I had cable TV yet. An odd question out of nowhere, but I answered saying that I didn't. We couldn't afford to have it yet. But we did have Netflix, so I was alright. He laughed and said, Oh no, you need to have TV. You have to be bored over there all by yourself all the time. I've got a spare cable and I'll come over and splice it up for you and you can share mine. I thought this was simply a kind gesture, and never thought anything of it, but I declined the offer, truthfully telling him I couldn't have him do that. It would be dishonest, and I could get into trouble, as technically it would be stealing. He laughed and assured me it was fine, and told me he could come over later to hook it up. I was kind of briefly taken aback that he was so insistent on giving me free TV, so I just told him I would ask my husband about it and let him know. He said, All right, well, find out and let me know. I'm always here and can come over anytime. 
I gave a polite nod and excused myself back inside, dismissing it and going back to my laptop to work. A few days passed, and I would see him outside, and he'd always bring up the cable thing, wanting to come over to install it for me. The odd thing was that every time I went outside, he would come outside too. Every single time. I was one of those people who was pretty oblivious, and I didn't really follow my gut feeling here, telling myself I was being ridiculous for finding it weird that he always seemed to go outside when I was. One night around 7 to 8 o'clock, after my husband left, he walked over, knocked on my door, and when I answered, he was his polite and perky self, asking me, Hey, is it a good time to come do that cable line for you? I was stunned, and I told him, uh, uh, I talked to my husband, and he said he isn't comfortable with it, that we're okay with just using Netflix for now. He replied with a sigh and a diminishing eye roll. It's fine. He's missing out. I can just come do it real quick, no problem. I started to get really uncomfortable. I laughed out of a nervous habit, going along with it and saying, Oh, I know, that's just how he is, but my mom is about to pick me up for dinner, so I have to get going. Thank you, though. He then stepped back and waved as he hurriedly replied. Oh, okay. Well, uh, bye bye I shut the door, bolted it, and called my mom, telling her I was afraid to be alone, as I was still new to not living at home anymore. I asked her if I could spend the night, and so I did. I never mentioned why I was uncomfortable. I think I was still just reminiscing the warning signs. Well, not too long after this, I randomly started noticing these weird little holes in my bedroom wall. I would putty them and then later find more and putty those, then find more again. I was so stupid back then, because I thought it was from maybe some sort of bug, just burrowing small holes similar to how bees or termites do. Mr. Bill would continue to offer his free cable. He even offered to come sit with me on nights my husband wasn't home. I continued to be polite, but I didn't suspect too much. Our apartment had a back door and window on our bedroom, and as I was in bed with my husband, I was playing on my phone when the streetlight illuminated around a man's form walking past the window. Then someone tried to turn the door handle from the other side. I shook my husband awake and told him someone was at the door. He called out, Hello? It stopped. A shadow immediately passed by, returning in the direction from which it came. I was stunned, and my husband said it was probably one of the drunk neighbors. And so we just went back to bed. Ugh, writing this out is just as painful for me to admit as it is for you to read. You're probably in shock at how dumb we were, too, huh? Anyway, we moved out of that apartment after a few months, as we needed a bigger place, since I was expecting and we found a nice duplex for a while. However, here's where things got crazy. One night, I'm at my husband's job with him as I would sometimes hang out there during his shifts, and I was talking to his coworker, who was a very sassy and outspoken Latina who didn't take crap from anyone. <laughs> I loved her. Anyway, she had recently gotten a new place of her own, and I was asking how she liked it. She told me it was nice. She was enjoying it, and asked me about my own, which I too told her how nice it was, and this is how that conversation proceeded. Yeah, I really like it a lot. We have a fenced-in backyard and more room inside, plus a nice porch too. Not at all like our last place. Ugh, it was getting to be cramped, I said. Where did you live? She asked. I told her. The apartment's over on White Valley Road. There was a sudden change in her expression. Wait, you know there was a pedophile living there, right? My blood ran cold at hearing this. I'm pretty sure all the coloring left my face. What? Who? I asked her in shock. She replied, I don't know his name, but yeah, girl. He was a creepy mofo that lived on the end with like car stuff always out on the left side, always getting young kids or teens really going in and out of there. He got arrested not too long ago. I stood there with my jaw on the floor, 
my body prickling with fear and an unsettling chill going up my spine. That had to be him. That was his apartment, for sure. But I was in disbelief. If that was true, there had to be a charge, I thought. So I pulled out my phone immediately, pulling up the Watchdog Sex Offender website, and I typed in my old address. It felt like it took forever for the page to load, and there it was, a big red dot on top of my previous small apartment complex. If you're not familiar with how those work, red is the worst map marker that can appear on this particular website. I hesitated for a moment before clicking the map marker, and as I'm sure you've guessed by now, when the page loaded, there he was, Mr. Bill. A list of charges ranging from before I was even born was shown. Charges for molesting children, the disabled, and even forcible rape and assault on someone. I felt like I couldn't catch my breath, as every odd memory I had from that place flooded my mind. Now, how he wasn't in jail, I don't know, but all I can say is the same thing that most of us have heard, read, or even posted before, and that is to trust your gut and watch for those red flags. Thank God he was watching out for me. I was beyond naive, and things could have ended badly for me. Judging by those frequent holes in the walls, he had been peeping on me and my husband, and hopefully he wasn't filming it. Otherwise, I'm sure there's probably videos of me out there, undressing or having alone time with my husband. I'll never know for sure, and frankly, I don't want to know. That's my workplace horror story. If you think you can avoid creeps working from home, you'd be dead wrong. Stay safe. The Worst Walk Home from Cousin of a Writer. For a while in my life, my boyfriend and I had to share a car. For the most part, it wasn't a problem. Usually it just meant I'd have to be dropped off at my work while he went to college, and once my shift was over, he'd pick me up. At the time, I was working at a pretty large motel chain as a housekeeper, which despite what they tried to tell me, was really just a fancy name for a maid. I usually worked mornings since they fit better into my own schedule outside of work. But that day I was scheduled for a night shift, which was from 3pm to 1am. The whole day was absolutely horrible. So many rude and so many creepy customers. And while I could probably write a whole post about the creeps that were always there, or the actually horrifying state so many of these people left their rooms in, no, my story comes from the fact that my boyfriend couldn't pick me up that night. He had to go to marching practice at his college with the rest of the marching band, which left me with a seven-mile walk back home. One guy did offer me a ride home from work, but I feel like if I'd gotten in his car, I'd be telling a completely different scary true story right now. Anyway, after refusing to hop in my coworker's car, I went back inside grabbed a few water bottles for my journey, and picked up my book bag that was in my locker. I said goodbye to the security staff and headed on my way. To be completely honest, I didn't really care about the distance of the walk. I'd go hiking most weekends. I mostly worried about walking home after dark. Even though I'm a guy, and usually we don't get messed with during night walks, I still was very, very nervous about it, just because of how little civilization there was on the walk. Instead, there were a lot of large patches of trees and woods all over the place. Anyway, I started walking home, and soon left the motel property entirely. I was walking past the nearby shopping center and the apartment complexes. Every step of the way so far, I was honestly enjoying the walk. The cold night air and the occasional car driving by were peaceful. The crickets chirping and the rare hoots of owls were just as nice to hear. These are still sounds I enjoy to this day. Though my legs were burning like hell at one point, having worked such a long shift already, I was still joyfully walking away from civilization and soon found myself in the wooded chunk of land between my work and my home. The whole vibe changed very quickly once I got there. Seeing these trees usually made me happy, and I usually liked to hike around this area during the day, but now it felt dark and foreboding, 
but with a deep breath, I continued forward. At that time, two cars passed by, and as both got close, I remember getting very nervous about each one, and afterwards, this left me very anxious. In that foreboding moment, I continued on walking in the dark. Then, as if on cue to make me even more scared, I heard three loud cracks echo in the woods nearby. I looked in the direction of the noise, and three more cracks came. I stumbled back and fell onto the road. I landed with a thud and looked around for where these sounds were coming from. I remember I was breathing really heavily, struggling to get back up. Still shaken, I began to jog ahead a bit, occasionally looking behind me over my shoulder. Having grown up in the area, I had heard tales of what that might be out there, making that kind of noise. Bigfoot, slamming a tree branch against a tree to threaten me. Of course, I didn't believe that's what it was. It was simply a thought that crossed my mind. However, at the time, I thought it was just some kids messing around, or even wannabe Bigfoot hunters trying to get a response back from a real Bigfoot. I'd seen people do that before all the time in these woods, though not being able to see them doing it this time did make the whole thing much creepier compared to when they did it during the day. It took a bit, but eventually I calmed down enough to enjoy my walk again. I stopped jogging once I thought I'd gotten far enough away from those noises. At this point, I want to say I was somewhere in the ballpark of two miles done with five more to go, only four more of which would be wooded. I was definitely out of breath at this point from jogging for so long, and I had that weird metallic taste all inside my mouth and throat from when you overexert yourself. I think it was around this point I pulled out my phone to see how my boyfriend was doing at practice. He responded to my text with a picture of his pants covered in mud, then a video of the band instructor telling them they were going to have to run the whole set again, to which the whole band groaned and moaned about it. I laughed and texted him that I was the lucky one, I guess, despite having to walk home alone. He asked how it was going so far, and after I told him it was pretty nice other than some weird noises in the woods. He agreed it was probably Bigfoot hunters since our small town is somewhat famous for them, and then he texted that he had to go back to marching. With a sigh, I went back to walking alone, though I was no longer glued to my phone, so I guess it was overall better for my safety, though I sure didn't feel any safer. Part of me enjoyed just looking at my phone while walking, but I couldn't bring myself to do it unless I was talking to him. I was always a bit nervous about a car pulling up to me without me noticing, or me somehow missing a snake on the path or something. So instead, I'd usually just pocket it on my nature walks instead of stare at it, even if it did give me comfort. It was around that time I noticed I hadn't seen any cars for a while, though to be fair, not many people probably drove down this road that late. I trudged along, thinking about how nice a hot bath or shower with my boyfriend would be once we were both home, inspired by cuddling him to keep going. Then, a bit later, another three thwacks occurred. This time they sounded a bit more behind me than directly to the side. I spun around and squinted my eyes, trying to make out any shapes in the dark. When I couldn't see anything, really, I turned on my phone flashlight and shined it into the forest. I thought I saw a pair of eyes staring back at me, though with how low to the ground they were, I assumed it was a coyote or something else. Though the idea of a mountain lion or something like that stalking me did cross my mind. I walked backwards a bit, though after the eyes didn't follow me and eventually wandered off, I felt safe, assuming that I was just seeing something like a coyote watching me walk past. That still didn't explain the noises from the woods at all. I'd been a bit worried about either of those things being the cause. Though I did always feel safe in this town, I definitely worried a lot about the wildlife, with this place being so full of wilderness, especially compared to the cities I was used to living in for most of my life. By then, I was probably close to halfway home, and I was slowing down a bit. I didn't want to, but I was getting tired. You know how it goes. Even on hikes, you start out strong, but later on, you're far more sore and tired. I digress. Around the halfway point, I heard another three thwacks. I remember rolling my eyes at this point, assuming now more than ever it was just Bigfoot hunters getting desperate for any sign of Bigfoot himself. I toyed with the idea of howling and whooping into the night, 
but I didn't want to feed what I thought was ignorance at the time. Then there were three more. I groaned and worried a bit that they were increasing in frequency and would continue all night. Then three more yet again. I shook my head and laughed a bit at it, but I still kept walking. But then, instead of another three cracks, I heard the loudest roar I had ever heard in my life. After that happened, the forest fell silent, like some judge had just called order in the court. I froze for a moment and began to look around the woods again. A bit nervously, I lifted up my phone and turned on the flashlight again. I saw two glowing eyes like before, looking directly at me. They were still low to the ground. I continued walking without breaking eye contact. But then... Those two eyes began to rise higher and higher from the ground until they were way above my own. I freaked out, spinning around and running across the road to the other side of the street. Once I got there, I shone my light back into the woods the direction those eyes were in. The eyes were still just as high up, but now they were closer. It was still on the other side of the street from me. It occasionally blinked as I walked backwards, keeping an eye on it. Sometimes, during one of its blinks, it would move closer to the road, but it never did get close enough for me to see any real details, just its bright eyes shining back at me. I continued to stare back, though it probably only saw my light. That was possibly a good thing, as I was far more terrified than fierce in these kinds of moments. I remember feeling like whatever it was was simply toying with me or testing me, seeing if I'd run again or stop where I was. I kept walking backwards, trying my best to keep steady. However, I hadn't planned on tripping over a massive branch on the side of the road. I fell back, feeling pain shoot through my body from my tailbone. I remember yelling out in pain, and then that thing roared back when I did. At this roar, I scrambled to find where my phone had landed, the screen had a crack in it now, but still the flashlight worked. I shone it back across the road, and the eyes seemed much, much closer than before. Slowly I rose, and I went back to carefully walking backwards, but now I was sure to check behind me for branches or rocks every few steps, never taking my gaze away for too long when I did. After what must have been 15, maybe 20 minutes, those towering eyes slunk back into the woods. I took this as my cue, and reinvigorated out of fear, I sprinted down the side of the road for as long as I could. I ended up getting a coughing fit and had to stop to catch my breath. My lungs were on fire then, and every cough only tore apart my throat more. Eventually, once I'd calmed my breathing, I felt very nauseous, and I threw up a bit in the woods. I wiped my mouth with my sleeve, and I turned around, frantically checking my surroundings. If anyone else had been on that road that night, they'd have probably thought I looked crazy. I was shaking constantly, and breathing so loud. I probably would have scared off a coyote or a mountain lion if that had been what was seemingly hunting me. But luckily, I was alone now, and there was no longer a big creature behind me. I spun back around, started speed walking down the road, and checked my phone. My boyfriend had texted me that he'd just finished practice and would be home once he got all his stuff put away and printed out his new sheet music he'd need to memorize. I wanted to text him what was happening to me, but I worried he wouldn't believe me at all. I was worried he'd think I was trying to get him to pick me up after I'd already agreed to walk, that I was trying to guilt trip him. But at the same time, I really wanted to tell him to tell someone what was going on, to not feel crazy about everything. Besides him, I didn't really have anyone else to call at the time. My parents didn't approve of our relationship, his didn't either, and I moved away from the city I grew up in some time ago. I kinda just lost contact with everyone. I smiled at the text and sent back, Almost home, bet you a kiss I'll get there first. He responded with a, You're on and I continued on my way, hoping seeing him would make up for this horrible day, hoping that by simply giving myself something to look forward to, I could push this whole thing to the back of my mind for a bit. I wanted to just rush the two of us back home as soon as possible, so I could get back to normality. 
As I went on, I felt I had to have been getting close to home by then. I must have been walking for about an hour and 40-ish minutes, but at the time I remember feeling like it had been three hours, though that's probably just from my anxiety and fear. From what I could tell, I was close to being back to civilization after just a little while longer. I could just make out the shape of the gas station near our house. Joyfully, I hurried on, walking a bit faster. When I was about a five minutes walk away from the gas station, I felt like I was home clear, now able to see the occasional car pulling in or driving past the gas station into a different part of the small town. It was then that I heard three more thwacks. I froze in place as I heard another roar following quickly afterward. Slowly, I kept walking, when after about my fourth or fifth step, I heard the cracking of wood against wood again and another roar. I stopped once more, my heart racing. I wasn't sure what to do. I could run for it, I thought, and despite all my fear, I bolted ahead, running until my legs gave out from under me due to exhaustion. I slid a bit forward, lifting myself up and spitting dirt out of my mouth. Another roar sounded even closer this time, and from my right instead of my left, like all the others had been. I stayed still, not sure what to do, as four large creatures began to stir in the woods nearby, barely illuminated by the gas station's neon sign down the road. These four figures came out of the woods maybe six or seven feet in front of me. Then they ran across the road. From the glimpses I saw of them, from my prone position, they reminded me of gorillas or orangutans. Their fur or hair was a dark brown, and their skin on their hands and feet and faces looked to be a very dark gray or black. Well, that went for most of them. There was one that stuck out. It was all black, jet black fur and skin, as dark as the night itself. I started to try to get up once they passed me, when more sounds began to echo from the woods. More of what sounded like branches being slammed against trees. I froze where I was, and they stopped, as one larger than the others emerged from the thicket. It was dragging a massive branch. Well, I guess it was more of a log, actually. I peered up at it, swearing I could see a bit of a feminine shape or outline to it. It had dark brown fur with some patches missing on it. It not only looked a lot bigger, but older, too. It stomped past me, and partway across the road it whooped loudly. Another one in the woods across the road whooped back, and it finally left the road and disappeared into the woods. It left the log on the other side of the road. Slowly and cautiously, I stood up. I was beyond freaked out at that point, and after a bit of walking where nothing else happened, I ran the rest of the way to the gas station. Outside of the station, filling up his tank, was an older gentleman. He looked very worried as I made my way to the building. You all right, son? He asked me. I bent over, trying my best to catch my breath, and wheezed out a... Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. You sure don't seem like it. Something happened? No, no, I'm fine, really, I said, starting to walk away. I stumbled a bit, and he caught my shoulders and helped steady me. Son, you don't really seem okay, and what was with all that screaming and yelling about in the woods you ran out of? No, really, I'm okay. I'm just trying to get home fast is all. You need anything? Looks like you took a nasty spill or two on your run. Huffing and puffing, I managed to squeak out a, no, really, I'm good. But I think he could see it in my eyes that I wasn't good. He could see how shaken I was, not just physically, but mentally. Well, I can't just leave you like this. How about a ride home? He asked. Now, usually I wouldn't hop into a stranger's car, but right in that moment, I wanted to get away from the woods as fast as possible and just get home. I nodded, hopped in, and waited for him to pay for his gas. All right, you live close by? He asked as we pulled out into the road. Yeah, down the road that way, I said, pointing. He nodded and began to drive me home. The whole time I kept looking back in the mirrors at the woods thinking I'd see something, but hoping that I wouldn't. You, uh, sure you're alright, son? 
You seem awfully shaken up. Yeah, I'm sure. I just... Oh, on the left right here. He turned and soon I saw my apartment complex. Okay, son. Just be careful if you go for a midnight walk in those woods again. There are strange things in there, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there are. I agreed with him. The rest of the drive was silent besides the directions to my complex and me thanking him profusely for doing that. He told me it was no problem and to stay safe. I told him to stay safe too and hobbled to my door, unlocked it, and went inside. I did manage to beat my boyfriend home by a few minutes. However, he was far more concerned about the state I was in than the bed we'd made. I told him everything. He said that it was amazing, and sounded like a family of Bigfoot getting territorial at me walking in their space, or so close to their kids. That's what he assumed the shorter ones were. I asked if he thought I was crazy. He told me no, that it was almost too good to be true, but that he believed me. That's the story of how I almost got mauled by a Bigfoot for getting too close to their kids. Only two good things came from this. One being that I never have to walk home alone from work again, and the other being our shared love of cryptids and such. However, I still don't think you'll ever find me looking for Bigfoot out in the woods. Oh me, oh my. Even if you do manage to clock out, seems something nightmarish might just find you on your way home. Unless your sexually demented neighbor spies you first, of course. Well, my break is over, and I've got a cold brew machine to decorpsify, I guess. I'll see you again on my next break, with more tales from the break room. Warning. The following episode contains depictions of animal abuse and implicated sexual violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Oh... Are you going on break too? I have to say, it's been quite the stressful shift so far. What with all the new shipments of coffee beans actually being someone's fingernails and whatnot, how does that even happen? I mean, the flavor was nice, sure, but still, we can't go selling that to customers now, can we? Ah, but I know why you're here. Not just for a brief respite, but because you want to hear yet another story from someone out there who encountered the horrifying while working. Well, I've got just the delight for you today. Just one story, but it features a young girl who works as a pet sitter for the families in her community. However, a relaxing weekend pet sitting quickly turns into a hellish fight for survival. I do hope you're ready to be scared, because when you clock in, you may never clock out. This is a tale from the break room. Why I'll Never House It Again From Beatrix is Strange When I was around 15 years old, I house sat, dog sat, and babysat quite frequently. I'd begun to get a reputation around school of being a reliable person who wouldn't throw parties or anything of the sort when I house sat. Usually, it would be for the more popular kids I was friends with, who would be going off for the weekend, getting away with their parents. Basically saying I should just hang around their house for the weekend and their parents would give me wads of cash. In actuality, it was the average pay rate. But I was always willing to hang out with my friends' pets or just chill in a house fancier than my family's and get paid to do so. Most people knew about it. And despite some light teasing about me never being invited to an actual party, I honestly enjoyed the work. It allowed me to help out my mom financially and gave me a bit of spending money on the rare occasion I did go out with friends. Probably after a year of this, I got a bit of a strange offer. My math teacher, who was also a family friend, let's call him Mr. C, approached me after class while I was packing my bags. He asked me, Hey, do you still pet sit? I gladly responded that I did, asking why. He told me he and his wife were going to go out of town for the three-day weekend, and he was wondering if I could watch his dog and his house for that time. I happily agreed, telling him my rates. We went about planning when I'd arrive and when they'd be back at the end of the weekend. At the time, it seemed like a really regular gig, 
though I'd be lying if I didn't feel a bit hesitant about it with him being my teacher and all that. I hadn't ever house sat or pet sat for a teacher before, and I wasn't really sure if he or I could get in trouble for that. But the money was too much to pass on, and honestly, he'd always seemed well off, especially for a teacher. And I was a bit excited to stay in what I was hoping was a nice house. The next day came and went. After school and my photography club meeting, I was on my way over to Mr. C's house. I told my mom about it the day prior and promised I'd call her once I got to the house and after they headed out so she would know I was safe. I drove to the address he had given me and it was legitimately in the middle of nowhere, about 10 miles out of town in the desert. For privacy reasons, I'll just say I lived in the Southwest, but I won't go into which state or city I lived in at the time. Suffice to say, it was really quite beautiful there and felt very much like a nice private getaway. His house itself was a nice adobe-style building with a wall going around it. I parked next to his and his wife's cars, texted my mom that I made it there safely, then headed to the wooden door of the outer wall that led into his front yard. I knocked, and in case they were inside, I loudly spoke. Mr. C, it's B, I'm here to dog sit. For a moment, it was just silence, so I knocked and yelled again. Mr. C, it's B, I'm here to house sit. After a moment, I heard footsteps on gravel. Finally, he opened the door. Oh, hi, B, let me show you inside. The yard was gorgeous and wrapped around the whole house from what I could tell. Mr. C led me inside through the front door, which I noticed was mostly glass. There was a guest bedroom, which I would be staying in, the master bedroom, which he asked me to avoid going into as he felt uncomfortable about it, and if I'm being honest, I did as well. There was the kitchen and dining room, which were both very open, and while going through them, Mr. C said I could help myself to whatever they had in the fridge. We then went on into the living room, which had one couch and one recliner and a massive flat screen TV. Mr. C said I could watch whatever I wanted. He also pointed out where the bathrooms were and then asked, So, you're ready to meet the dog you'll be watching? I nodded, and he opened their back door, a second sliding glass door, and let in this massive dog. He was a mutt to be sure, but if I had to bet, he definitely had some Great Dane in him. This is Roscoe. Mr. C said, despite how big of a dog he was, he was extremely calm and cautious and he approached me very meekly. We feed him three times a day, four scoops of dog food. He pointed to the large tub of dog food in the kitchen. It was just about the same height as the counter and we usually have to refill his water bowl twice a day. I nodded and repeated back the amount he ate and drank. Mr. C continued, You'll need to clean up after him in the yard daily, and maybe take him for a walk or two every day. His leash is by the doghouse outside. I glanced outside and saw the doghouse. It was one of those igloo-shaped ones, along with dozens of toys scattered across the yard. Okay, anything else I need to know? I inquired. Hmm, not that I can think of, really. Oh, he's allowed on all the furniture and stuff. Just to make sure he's inside once it's hot out. Of course, it's been super hot lately. Mr. C nodded. Yeah, and uh, other than that, Roscoe loves to roughhouse, but just make sure he doesn't break anything. I gave another nod and smiled, then crouched down to pet Roscoe some more. He didn't really seem like the roughhousing kind of dog at all, but maybe he was just nervous since I was new. Anyway, I think that's everything. And thanks again, B. We left 50 bucks on the counter for pizza if you wanted to order it any of the days you're here, and a spare key for you to use when you walk Roscoe. Thanks, Mr. C. You didn't have to do that. Oh, it's no worries, B. Thanks again. My wife and I have been wanting to get out of town for months, but we couldn't leave Roscoe here with no one to watch him. He walked to his room while talking and came back out holding luggage. Well, time to head out if we're going to get to the hotel on time. Thanks again, B. And with that, he headed out the door of the house and then the door out of the yard. I turned back to Roscoe and pet him some more. Hey boy, want to watch some TV and relax? I'll be taking care of you for the next few days. He wagged his tail a bit much, still seeming squeamish. I walked over to the couch and he followed me, hopping into the lone recliner and curling up. I shrugged it off, 
thinking if he hadn't warmed up to me yet, that was fine. I had just barely gotten here after all. I texted my mom again that they had left and that I was still okay. I then turned on the TV and clicked over to Netflix. There was Mr. C's profile, Mrs. C's profile, and a guest one. I was tempted to look through what shows Mr. C had watched, but instead clicked on guest. I turned on a horror movie. I think it was one of the paranormal activity movies. I know they had those on there for some time. I settled in for the night after I called to order an extra large Hawaiian pizza. I did open the front sliding door so I could hear when the pizza got there. The cold, desert air mixed with the horror movie led me to bundling up under the blanket that was on the back of the couch. Once I heard the knock from the pizza delivery guy, I jumped out of fear. Then after a moment, I realized it was just my pizza. So I ran to the kitchen, grabbing some of the money, then ran outside. I opened the wooden door slightly and peeked out. Hi, one large Hawaiian? Yep, that's it, I said with a grin. I paid the amount and gave a good tip due to how long the drive was. Back inside, the TV was off. That was weird because I thought I left it on. I placed the pizza down in the kitchen, closed and locked the front door and walked into the living room. Roscoe was now cowering in the corner and the TV remote was on the floor next to the blanket I'd tossed off. Oh, I'm sorry, Roscoe. I didn't mean to throw the remote. I said, reaching out my hand. He whimpered and crawled over to me. I pet him as he whined until he stopped, and from there I led him over to the couch. He hopped up and walked in a circle before plopping onto the couch. I went and grabbed some pizza on a plate, making sure to close the box. Hoping to lighten the mood, I watched some sitcoms until bedtime, before heading to the guest room with Roscoe and getting into bed. He actually hopped up onto the bed too, and seemed to pass out right away. I, on the other hand, found it hard to sleep. Taps and thuds kept happening throughout the night, but I assumed it was just the house settling, and I wasn't used to it yet. The next morning, I eventually woke to Roscoe pawing at the door, whining. I opened it, and he ran to the back door, so I let him out. While he was busy doing his business, I went over to my pizza to grab a slice or two for breakfast. But there was something wrong. I remembered closing the box, but there it was open, and a few more extra slices were missing. At first, I was a bit weirded out, but I quickly assumed I had just eaten more than I remembered the night before, especially with how in and out of the kitchen I'd been. I went ahead and grabbed a slice of cold pizza and ate it while putting my shoes on. Then I went to grab Roscoe's leash. Roscoe was very hesitant to go on the leash, but once I clipped it on him, he seemed like an entirely different dog. He was jumping around and barking in joy. I remember saying something along the line of, well, it's good to finally meet you, Roscoe. Before heading out for the walk, I made sure to lock the front and back door. Then we headed out the gate. I was greeted by the dirt road, as well as mine and one of their cars out front. I walked him for about an hour, which honestly wiped me out. I wasn't used to walking any dog for that long before. By the time we got back, I was a hot and sweaty mess. Roscoe lapped up water eagerly as I scooped his food for him. I placed his bowl down, and while he was eating, I filled up his water. I then helped myself to another slice of well-earned pizza. Then I shoved the box into the fridge the best I could. Weirdly enough, once I took Roscoe's collar off, he was back to his shy self, and throughout the day when I'd go to pet him, he would just duck out of the way again, flinching. I definitely found this odd but I thought maybe Mr. C or his wife had dished out some harsh punishments in his youth. I tried to comfort the poor guy, telling him I'd never hurt him, but as I said before, at the time I was new to him. Throughout the day, I relaxed and watched more TV, making sure to clean up here and there since I was also house-sitting after all. I made sure to feed Roscoe at all the appropriate times, enjoying basically getting paid to binge Netflix and talk to my friends on the phone all day. However, I didn't tell my friends where I was house-sitting and who for. I had only told my mom, because she and Mr. C had been friends since they were in high school together. I didn't tell anyone else because I was worried it would be embarrassing, or there would be rumors starting or something. Honestly, I didn't want to ruin Mr. C's career, as he'd always been one of my favorite teachers. And I also didn't want any of my fellow classmates to think I was sleeping with one of the teachers, Instead, I told them that I was house-sitting for a family friend, and I left it at that. When I went to bed that night, with Roscoe, I had trouble falling asleep again. 
Occasionally, there were thuds and bangs, which kept me up for much of the night, and I remember hearing the distinct sound of the fridge opening. I knew that couldn't be the house settling, so this time, I got up. Slowly, I crept out of the bed and peeked into the kitchen. By the time I had done so, I hadn't caught anyone or anything, and honestly, I was worried I had scared myself really bad with that horror movie the night before. I joked with myself that obviously the house was just haunted, which only made the night worse overall for me. I tossed and turned a lot that night, and when I did fall asleep, I had a nightmare. Though I can't remember what it was about, only that I had a lot of trouble sleeping well thanks to it. The following morning, probably out of paranoia, I checked all the rooms with Roscoe, starting with the bathroom, then to the living room, kitchen, dining room, then the yard. However, I hesitated to open the door to Mr. and Mrs. C.'s room. It felt wrong to open it, but I still wanted to be sure, so I did peek inside, and I saw their empty room. I stepped in slowly, turning back to try to get Roscoe to come with me. However, he wouldn't follow me. I found it weird, but I guessed that they didn't like Roscoe sleeping on their bed. I checked nervously, looking in their bathroom, and when I saw nothing, I went back to the living room and closed the door behind me. I joined Roscoe on the couch, but I found him whimpering again like he was in trouble. Despite Roscoe's weird behavior, the rest of the morning was normal and enjoyable. Around lunchtime, I had accidentally tripped on a rug, spilling grape soda and leftover pizza all over their couch. I panicked, like anyone would at that point, and went to call Mr. C to find out where exactly all his cleaning supplies were. Quickly, I pulled up my contact list, scrolling to C, where I kept all my customers' contact info by putting their last names in as customer. Then I clicked on his name. The phone rang. That's when I heard a phone ringing inside the master bedroom. I froze in fear for a moment and was more than a little freaked out. I crept as quietly as I could to the door and opened it up again. I walked in and on their bed, I saw a cell phone buzzing away with my name on the screen as the caller. I walked over and looked around before hanging up. I tried to rationalize this, assuming Mr. C had forgotten his phone here. I decided I'd just have to call Mrs. C instead, but I didn't have her phone number, so I'd have to call my mom and see if she knew it. But my mom didn't have her phone number either. She remembered in the past not really getting along well with that woman. She told me she would look through some of her old texts and emails to see if she could find it, but in the meantime, she told me to calm down and to just look around the house for some cleaning supplies to try to take care of the mess myself. I was practically in tears since I had spilled it, but my mom's voice comforted me, so I began to search for anything I could use to clean it up. I ended up finding the laundry room in what I thought was the hallway closet, so I got some detergent, hot water, a sponge, and some towels, then went off to cleaning the seats. It took nearly the whole day, but I kept myself at it with the promise of stuffing myself with the other half of the cold pizza I'd left, and that I could try to play with Roscoe outside when I was done. A lot of scrubbing and cleaning later, I finished getting most of the stain out. Roscoe had been very comforting while I was cleaning it, lying next to me and giving me kisses throughout the time it took. I remember my back was killing me afterwards, and I stretched up, popping my back, and went to grab some nice cold pizza, since I hadn't eaten any lunch that day. However, when I got to the fridge, the pizza box was practically empty, with only one slice left. Utterly confused and a bit creeped out, I threw out the pizza and the box and just settled on microwaving one of the frozen dinners they'd left in the freezer. While it was cooking, I fed Roscoe and refilled his water. After that, while I was letting my meal cool, I looked outside to see how dark it was getting. Sorry, Roscoe, no walk today. I'll make it up to you with an extra long walk tomorrow. Roscoe didn't seem bothered in the least and just went back to licking his bowl clean. I tried to rack my head around how I'd lost so much pizza while I ate, and while I hadn't done it in years, I guessed maybe I'd slept walk, or slept eight, as it was. Maybe it was brought on by me sleeping in a different house. I wasn't entirely sure. I think I was just looking for any non-freaky excuse, and probably should have realized something was wrong much sooner. Around bedtime, my mom called me, 
She seemed really panicked, and she told me that she'd found something out. B, from what I can tell on Facebook, Mr. and Mrs. C got divorced about eight years ago. Huh? Well, maybe he got remarried. I tried to rationalize. Maybe, but B, I'd like you to come home now. I don't feel good about any of this. I thought mom was overreacting, but I also had to admit I had been creeped out a bit too. Well, what should I do about Roscoe? I asked. I don't know, B, but I'd really like you to leave. Maybe just bring Roscoe with you and we can just bring him back later. Mom, if it got out I did that, no one would ever hire me again, I protested. B, if you don't come home, I'm just going to head over there to get you. N no, Mom, you don't have to do that. I think I'm just freaking myself out. He probably just forgot his phone. Annoyed, my mom responded. Still, I don't like this, B. I'm heading over there if you're stuck on staying there. I sighed. Fine. I'll see you in a bit, Mom. I was beyond annoyed at this, and with all my teenage angst, I'd come to the conclusion she didn't think I could do this. With it being super late, I brought Roscoe into my room and closed the door, deciding to just hang out on my phone until Mom got there. While scrolling on Facebook, I'd heard more knocking and bumps, and at this point I began to get more nervous. So I decided to call my mom back. Hey mom, I said. Is everything okay, B? When are you going to get here? I'm starting to get scared. I'll be there in about 20 minutes, but if you can't wait for me to get there, you can start the drive back home and I'll meet you on the road. No, I paused for a moment. No, I'll just wait for you. Are you sure, B? Yeah, I think so. A loud crash sounded from the bedroom next to me. B? B, what was that? Are you okay? I don't know, Mama. I think there's someone in the house. I cried into the phone. B, hide until I get there. I'm going to call the cops, okay? I'm going to hang up. Just stay silent and hide. Can you do that, B? Shakily, I responded with a yes, then put the phone down, backing away from the wall. Then I heard a door fly open somewhere else in the house. Footsteps raced towards the guest room door. I ran over and slammed against it, locking it and stepping back. B, let me in. I heard an all too familiar voice on the other side. It was Mr. C. Again, he slammed against the door hard. Why do you have to ruin it by calling your mom, B? It would have been so wonderful. Tears were running down my face as he kept slamming into the door. I ran over to the window opening it and kicking the screen out, but instead of running outside, I went and hid under the bed. Roscoe was barking and growling at the door, and as ashamed as I am to admit it, I just left him there, praying that Mr. C wouldn't get in. With the sound of splintering wood, I heard Roscoe whimpering. Dumb dog, I'm your owner, you don't growl at me. Then I heard a hard thud, and Roscoe yelped in pain. I covered my mouth to not start crying louder. Mr. C walked into the room. I watched his feet as he stood still for a moment. He swore and called me horrible names before running to the window and climbing out, shouting for me to come out, and that I had nowhere to go, that he had already slashed my tires. Tears poured down my face. I crawled out from under the bed and checked on Roscoe. His ribs were at a weird angle, but other than being in pain, he seemed okay. I grabbed his collar, and I walked with him into the hallway and into the master bedroom. I was assuming he wouldn't go back and check there, so I closed the door, then called 911. 911, what's your emergency? There's someone trying to hurt me, I struggled to say through tears. Alright, sweetie, where are you? I told them the address. Alright, we have someone on the way, but I can stay on the phone with you to keep you updated, okay? Okay. Now, is there anywhere you can hide? Yeah, I think so. There's a closet in this room. Good. Go there now. Are you alone other than your attacker? No, I have a dog with me. Okay, I'll let the team know. Bring him with you in the closet and close the door, okay? I struggled to answer but squeaked out an okay. I went to open the closet, and there I was, faced with something absolutely disturbing. 
All along the walls were pictures of girls from my school, with these disgusting things written with lipstick and sharpie all over them. I dropped my phone and somehow forgot to pick it back up. I think I was just in complete shock. A large portion of them were of me, with what he wanted to do with me written on them, stains on a lot of them from what you can only imagine. I slowly closed the door and huddled down with Roscoe. By the time I realized where my phone was, I heard Mr. C busting down the door to his bedroom. Come on, B, open up. I can show you such a wonderful world. I promise I won't hurt you. He pleaded with me. I felt so sick to my stomach. I began to violently shake in fear and panic. I guess he had seen where my phone was as he then opened the door and stood over me with a rag in his hand. I would later find out it was chloroform. Then Roscoe tore from my grip, his mouth foaming in rage. Growling, he pounced on Mr. C, knocking him over. I ran out of the room, leaving Roscoe behind again, something I still haven't forgiven myself for doing to this day. I then ran straight out of the house. I ran through the yard, my feet crunching the whole way to the gate, and I swung it open. I didn't have my keys in my pocket, so I ran past my car and down the dirt road, crying as I ran. After running a few minutes, I saw lights on in the distance and ran towards them. My mother and the police had arrived. My mom had barely parked her car before running over to me to hold me, tears in her eyes telling me she'd never let me go and that I was okay now. One of the officers stayed with us. The other continued to the house. A while later, a police car drove past us with Mr. C in the back. I remember his face, the way he glared at me through the window. Roscoe had been injured even more and was in critical condition. He was rushed to an animal hospital, and luckily, he made it through. My mom and I pushed and pushed to get to adopt him, and to this day, we have Roscoe, though he's much less of the guard he was when we got him, and more of just a big baby now. The police had found a lot of really dark things in that man's house. Terabytes of CP and on his computer. Horrific journal entries about what he had done to Roscoe and how he wanted to do that to other girls at my school, but especially me. And despite being the victim, rumors grew and spread around school like wildfire. So my mom and I moved across the country to escape. If there's a moral to the story, I guess it would be this. Parents, if you ever have an uneasy feeling about something, do everything you can to make sure your kid is okay. I know I probably wouldn't be here today if my mother hadn't done all she could. Every day, we leave our most precious ones for much of the day with teachers who often end up being little more than strangers. And on the rare occasion, a teacher might be something more vile than a stranger, something predatory. Someone you'd never in your wildest nightmare dare leave your child with. Well, looks like it's time for me to clock back in. I'll see you again on my next break with more tales from the break room. Until then, try to survive your next shift. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Whoa there, you're getting real good at timing your break with mine. If I didn't know any better, I'd guess you just can't get enough of these scary work stories. Eh, lucky for you, I do have a couple new ones to share. One about a man wielding the floppiest kind of danger, and the other about a sinister customer who might have never left the building. Enjoy, and don't you forget, if you ever decide to clock back in, you may never clock out. These are tales from the break room. Barter from Seraphim A few years ago, I worked at a furniture store as an assistant manager. We were located in a rough part of town, and there were frequently homeless people staying in our parking lots and in the woods surrounding the store. 
Needless to say, we had a lot of visits from the local police department. Our store was always open late in the evening, and no customers generally came in the last few hours the store was open. Well, one day we heard the door open and the bell ring. We were surprised and jumped up to greet this customer. Working in a commissioned sales environment, everyone was excited and hoping for a sale. The man who stood before us was dressed in torn pajama pants, a raincoat, and boots. He looked as if he had been drinking. And as we approached, this was confirmed by the smell of alcohol that wafted six feet from him in every direction. We greeted him all the same, although a little disappointed knowing that he was not going to buy anything, and this was likely going to be a waste of our time. Though as I said, it was always slow in the evenings, and it definitely broke up the monotony of staring at each other and checking reports. Do you have any tarps or cardboard that I can use? Looks like it's getting ready to rain. His voice was raw and gravelly from years of alcohol that no longer burned. Sorry, sir, I think we ended up putting it all in the dumpster. It has a compactor in it too, so I'm afraid I don't have anything to give you. My manager answered. He had come over to greet the customer as a form of protection for the younger sales girls. He had a no-nonsense way of letting men know that they had no business coming in here unless they were planning on doing business with us. Well, maybe you don't have any cardboard or a tarp. Maybe you have a blanket or something. Looks like you guys maybe sell blankets. You have a blanket? He gestured toward one of the tiered shells in the corner stacked with $150 designer blankets. I looked over at the shelf, then looked back at the man. Then my eyes darted over to my manager who was looking a bit frustrated with the situation. We do sell blankets, sir, and if you have money, you're more than welcome to purchase one. My manager looked at me as if to ask whether I was able to wrap this up and get this man out of the store. I nodded, and he excused himself to his office. The man looked at me, yawned, and scratched his stomach, which was bare underneath his raincoat. Listen, darling, you and me both know I don't have any money, but maybe I can barter with you. Maybe I have something you want. He winked and laughed, showing several missing teeth. And uh, just what is it that you think I'd be interested in? I asked, knowing darn well I was not going to do anything. He reached into an interior pocket in his raincoat, and my heart dropped. I instantly thought he was going to pull out a gun or something and that he was going to rob us. The seconds passed by slow like honey and agonizing while I held my breath and waited for the glint of metal to appear from inside his raincoat. Instead, to my shock, he pulled out a giant suction cup ended dildo. I lost all composure and started laughing hysterically. What? You look like the kind of lady who would enjoy something like this. I got it for free, but looks like it probably has some value to you. It ain't even dirty or used or nothing like that, just don't have a box is all. The man then proceeded to lick his thumb and wipe something black off the side of the dildo. I'm, I'm really not interested. Thanks a lot for the offer though and for the laugh. Fine, suit yourself. He shoved the dildo back in his raincoat, looking like he was happy enough to save it as a bartering tool for another occasion. Being a manager in the store, we had certain privileges, one of which was being able to adjust the pricing on any item in the store in case it was damaged or discontinued. I went behind the counter and grabbed one of the blankets, adjusting the pricing down to $5. I took some money out of my own pocket and threw it in the cash register. Five bucks seems like an awfully low price for the laugh I'd gotten, and if nothing else, it was going to count as good karma for the day. It was five minutes until closing then, and I knew if I didn't get him out of the store, my manager was going to have my ass, so it served a dual purpose of getting him out and doing a good deed of keeping him dry and warm for the night. When I handed him the blanket, he asked me if I'd like to meet him behind the store after work. Said he had a lot of other things back there that he could show me. I declined and he looked disappointed. He left with his blanket before my boss came out of his office 
and I was glad that he missed the fact that I had discounted the item so much and basically gave it away for free. Not that it would have been entirely an issue, but it was definitely something I'd rather not have to deal with at 10 at night. When we were locking up the building, I noticed that it was really dark in the parking lot, much darker than usual. It seemed one of our lights had burned out, or rather it looked to have been broken out. As I said earlier, we were in a bad part of town, and it wasn't surprising when buildings or street lamps were vandalized. I was ready to go home. It had been a long day and I was tired. I had missed my break too during the day due to some drama going on in the store. It was closing time and everyone fled quickly to their cars while I locked up the building and made sure that the alarm was set. There's usually about four of us at the end of the night, but tonight there were only three. My manager and the other coworker both got in their cars and drove off while I was turning around to face the parking lot to get to my car. As I began to walk, I began to hear footsteps behind me. I froze in place. Did you change your mind? I caught sight of that yellow raincoat before I saw the man himself. I put the keys between my fingers and stared at my Kia 40 feet away, wondering how far I'd get before he was able to catch me. If he was drunk as I thought, he was probably not very agile, but it seems drunk people always have that superhuman strength and endurance. No, please leave, I said in a gruff tone. He reached for my arm and I jumped out of his way. I bolted to my car and locking it with the key fob as I ran praying that he wasn't following me. I got into my car with my heart pounding through my chest and I locked my doors as fast as I possibly could. He was just standing there staring at me. That's when I realized the dildo he had offered me earlier in the night was suction cupped to my windshield. I drove home with it like that I didn't see the man the next morning, and I hoped that I would never see him again. A Winter Night at the Motel From S.C. This happened when I was 18. I was working at a run-down motel, and I still don't know what to make of it. There may be an easy explanation for what happened somewhere, but it's just weird to me. I've never been able to shake the feeling that I was missing part of a puzzle. Anyway, I grew up in central Utah. For anyone who hasn't been to Utah, the whole state is desert. In winters, the snow can be up to your thigh, and the chill can be such a slow pain you start to go a little mad for a while. Not every winter night is like that, but it only takes 20 minutes for everything to get blanketed with snow some nights. After high school, which I attended in the town over, I looked for a job so I could save for college. I had worked other places previously, but with an internship ending, I had to start over. The problem with my tiny town is that there are no businesses, not one. It's a tiny village that was settled by pioneers, and it's a bizarre mix of modern and antique. The place rocks a post office, a small park, and lots of churches. For the kids looking for work, it was a pain. The next town over wasn't anything big either, with one small grocery store and some schools and such. Eventually, scraping the bottom of the bucket, I landed a job working the night shift at a small run-down motel on the outskirts of the neighboring town. I would be working next to a jail, and my mother flipped since I was only an 18-year-old girl. But after a few weeks, my fears were pretty much put at ease. I was grateful for the job, and with little to do but drink cocoa and watch TV, it was a pretty sweet gig. I did my job well and still ended up with time to spare. My boss, who lived above the lobby, would take off on the weekends when I worked, claiming that if she didn't get away from work, she'd go mad. I understood that and got used to being alone. As a night owl and someone who's not into a god or anything supernatural, I'm not terribly easy to spook. Horror shows can put me in a funk, and every now and then I'd see weird stuff go down, but it was always things like druggies or dumb kids. Until about four months in. In winter, I have the added responsibility of making sure the walkways are all clear of snow, and in Utah, that's a bitter job. 
Bundled up, I'd clear one building's walkway all the way down to the rooms, and then past the gated abandoned pool into the second building. Oftentimes, when I got back up to the first building, there would already be two or three inches of snow. I did my best and lavished snow salt generously, and I'd go back to the lobby to wait for guests. I don't remember the night in particular when this all started, as my nights were all relatively the same, but I do remember the event with an obnoxious amount of clarity. It was just me alone, and I had to handle anything that popped up, so when it was snowing, I had to shovel, but also make sure I noticed when people pulled up, so I'd have to stop shoveling and go unlock the lobby and get them a room. On this night, it had been snowing heavily, and I'd been back and forth a lot shoveling and checking in people, who the weather forced off the roads. I was making my way back when I spotted a man standing by the lobby doors, under the extended ceiling that kept the doors clear. I ran up and apologized, saying that I hadn't seen him pull up. I remember thinking at the time that it was weird I hadn't seen a car. In the dead quiet of night, I can always hear a car crunching on the snow and see the headlights light up the night. But then again, I had been busy, so it didn't mean anything that I hadn't seen this car. I explained that I had to lock up every time I left, and I'd go around the side and let them in through the lobby. He nodded and said sure, but tried to follow me through the side. I stopped him and asked him to wait, because the side door goes behind the desk, so I can't let people in through that way. For a second he looked angry, but in an instant, he relaxed and nodded. I entered the building through the side door, locking the door behind me. I ran around the desk which was walled in, think like a dentist office where the desk is on the other side of a wall, and this leads to the stairs to my manager's apartment. Then I unlocked a door in the lobby so the guy didn't have to wait in the cold. I let him in, and as I was tugging off my snow gear and trying to smooth the hair that had gone frizzy from the cold, I got a look at him. The first thing I noticed was that he had no coat, which in the middle of winter in Utah can be brutal. The next thing I wondered was if he was one of those traveling priests or something. He cut a solid figure, with dark skin and hair and blinding white teeth. He was well kept in a purple dress shirt and black slacks. What made me think he was a father was the large gold cross hanging on a gold chain. It wasn't an overcompensating type of large, but it had to have been heavy. Also, if he was wet or cold, he didn't show it. Now, working night shifts, the only things to come on TV late at night are infomercials and crime dramas. So all the crime shows and episodes I'd seen had made me somewhat wary of unusual figures, especially ones that acted like they owned the place the way this guy did. Sure, I was young, but I wasn't stupid enough not to be aware of men staring me down. However, I'm a 5 foot 10 tall woman, and I lean towards overweight with plain features, but nothing special. I was never too worried about it. I'm not the kind of girl men waste their time on, so I always told myself I'd be fine. But with this guy, something was off. For one, he acted like I should be treating him like a celebrity, like he couldn't believe I wasn't tripping over myself to help him. After I'd peeled off my coat and gloves and hung them up and gone around my desk and sat, I asked him what I could do for him. He leaned over the counter on one elbow, getting really close with a perfect bright white grin. He casually explained to me that he had hitchhiked to this middle of nowhere town and told me about how it was so cold he just needed a place. I was sympathetic as I always am, especially in this weather where I try not to give anyone the boot. I've seen more than my fair share of people down on their luck, but as a kid working nights at a small rundown motel trying to save what she could for college, I couldn't be the hero every time, something I had to learn fast. So, what type of room would you like? I asked. He grinned at me in a friendly way that made me feel sort of bad for getting creeped out. I just need something small, he assured me. But I don't have any money. I tried not to wince. I hated turning people away. Well, the computer won't let me give anyone a room without a valid credit card number, I explained. That was the truth, albeit a tad stretched. He let out a little laugh and nodded. <laughs> well, I got nothing on me. 
He held out his hands as if to show me. I tried not to look upset. It was super uncomfortable being put in these situations. I'm sorry, I told him, but I can't give you a room without the credit card number. For the next hour or so, he tried all sorts of things. He begged me, told me to use my card to get the room and he'd pay me back, etc. After a while, I could see him getting angrier and angrier, but hiding it under his huge white smile, and he would pace a few steps back or look around before coming back. He moved on to sitting comfortably in the chairs and began trying to ask if he could sleep in the laundry room. No. The lobby? No. My car? Hell no. You won't even have to give me the keys, he said. Just turn it on for a bit to warm it up. Really, no. The whole time I was very accommodating. I was kind and let him watch TV. I gave him cocoa to warm up and even some food. I was a bit thrown as I pulled a few pastries from the breakfast I would set up in the morning and tried to offer them to him. And he just said, I'm not gonna eat these. Okay then. In a last ditch attempt to give this guy the boot who was getting closer and closer into my space, I offered the money in my wallet to him, maybe 10 or 15 bucks in small bills. He snatched it up without so much as a thank you. I told him that if he kept ordering coffee or something small at Denny's just a block or two down the road, then they would let him stay there, and maybe the truckers would give him a lift. Now, at this point, it was like 2 a.m., and I had things I needed to do, but by the rules, I couldn't leave a guest unattended. Finally, after his fourth or fifth time trying to persuade me to give him a key, I got an idea. My boss was gone for the weekend, but the ceiling creaked periodically, so I waited for a creak and to my relief, one came soon. He was talking, getting subtly angrier with me. His face twisted a little in a way that made me recant any ideas that he was a man of church. I held up my fingers to my lips in a shushing gesture. He looked shocked that I had shushed him, and I explained quietly. My boss lives upstairs and he's sleeping. To be honest, I'd do more for you if I could, but she comes down to check on me every few hours. He paused and stared at me for a minute, then laughed deeply. This threw me off, mostly because I had just shushed him, and he was now louder than before. <laughs> no, they're not. He sneered at me. I was taken aback. Before, he had been pushy, but now he was downright mean. My mind flashed to my taser in my bag that was sitting by the back door. Damn it. My boss lives up there, I said truthfully. He shook his head. The old man's not there, he insisted. Now I was confused. My boss was a 60-year-old woman who had been the manager since the place was bought out from the previous motel three years before. He sat in the tiny lobby drinking cocoa or coffee. I tried to turn up the volume on the TV so he might watch the TV, but the remote didn't respond. It would change channels just fine, but the volume stayed down. Also, I swear to God, several times when he was talking to me, I saw the flood of headlights that meant a guest had pulled in. But when I checked, not only was no one there, but there were no new tire tracks either. I would get up to check to get away from the guy, but the two or three times it happened, I was genuinely confused. Every time as I was sitting down, he'd lean in on his elbow and watch me. The thing that really confused me was right before he left. I think he saw that I wasn't going to back down, and he was standing in the lobby with his smile of angry disbelief. I swear, when I did this before, they knew better than this, he told me. I wondered if he'd gotten free nights at other places, but he was looking around the lobby like he knew this place. For a second, I considered calling a day manager, asking if I could just give this guy a room and get rid of him. But by this point, he had made me angry, stepping all over me the way he did. You're gonna know who I am, he told me. One day, you'll know who I am. Should I know who you are then? I was still playing kind hostess. I wondered if maybe he was a minor celebrity I didn't know about. That would explain his attitude and stupid big-ass cross. 
The fashion statement of a drama queen sort of suited this guy. No, but he should. Now he was dead serious. You will, he tacked on, adding to my impression that maybe he was a TV personality of some kind. After a little while, he got angry and made like he was going to leave. And right then, an SUV pulled up and a tired family got out, trudging their way inside. Distracted for a minute, I greeted them and asked about a room, only looking up for the guy after a minute or two, but he was already gone. I mean, just gone. I never saw him walk past me. I got the family a room, and as they left, I had a weird feeling, so I checked the kitchen, and I checked upstairs to make sure my boss's room was still locked. To be honest, I wouldn't put it past this guy. I bundled up and stepped outside, thinking maybe he had taken my advice to go to the Denny's and ask a trucker for a lift. The lobby was an extended ceiling that ends with pillars some 15 feet away, so that it's always dry when people pull up. Going to the edge of the dry spot, I tried to see where he had gone, but I couldn't see any figure in the distance going anywhere. It took me longer than I'm proud to admit, but I noticed eventually that there were no footprints in the snow, only the fresh tire tracks from where I could see the family had driven to and was now unloading their stuff. I spent the rest of the night paranoid, with no footprints in the fresh snow. That meant he had to be somewhere inside, and I wasn't sure what I should do. I mean, maybe he took a long way around or crossed the street back in the dark, where I couldn't see, but I couldn't shake the paranoia that he was stashed somewhere in the lobby or trying to break into a room. After talking with him for so long, I wouldn't have put it past him to do that. Eventually, morning came without further incident. I made breakfast, cleaned up, and waited for my weekend manager, who came in at six, to get there. While she was counting the money drawer to make sure it was balanced and doing the count out, I told her about this man. She laughed at my problem good-naturedly, but as she listened, her face grew skeptical when I described what the man looked like. Uh, did you get his name? She asked. I told her no, but I got the feeling she was doubting my story. On my next shift, there was a sticky note waiting for me. In red ink, it read, If any weird people hang around, call the cops. Cops will do rounds every few hours. Or something to that effect. Now, that caught my attention, and when my coworker saw I was finished reading it, she explained. Apparently, after I left my previous shift, the family I checked in in the middle of the night came up to her, and the father complained that some guy had been standing and staring in through their window. One of the kids had pulled back the heavier curtains, leaving only the gossamer ones, and apparently one of the younger kids cried to their mom that some guy was standing at the window. The mother saw him too, but when the dad checked, no one was there. I guess there was no description of him as the family just got a quick glance. But later in the day, an older lady who had been on the ground floor had mentioned that a very rude someone had knocked on her door and woke her up. When she didn't get up, because it was the middle of the night after all, the figure had knocked on her window for a while before leaving. The lady was just mad, but I had pretty much no doubt about whom it was, and I regretted not calling the cops. Finally, she told me, another co-worker had a run-in with a guy of the same description a few years prior, and she had quit right after. My co-worker was upset because the other girl had talked about the cross he wore like the one the guy I dealt with was wearing. I worked there for another five months, and although everything was fine, I always kept my taser close by. Even though I mostly forgot about it, I was forbidden from telling guests about it, Every now and then I'd get a tingle down my back and spend the rest of the night paranoid. These stories just go to show you, even if someone is so kind as to offer you the nastiest, floppiest dildo you've ever seen, that doesn't mean they're good people. So when your shift ends and you're walking back to your car, always keep an eye out. 
you never know when the worst sorts of people might be lying in wait. Well, my break is over. I'd better make sure that rat-human hybrid thing doesn't come back out from the storage room. Got kinda messy last time that happened. I'll see you again on my next break with more tales from the break room. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Oh man, I really needed this break. A busload of students just unloaded into the cafe and ordered all the hairy cookies we had in stock. I'm exhausted, and I'm reminded of my time back in school. To this very day, I've got some kind of lesser PTSD in the form of nightmares about being 20 years late for class. Ooh, makes me shudder. Today's story might make you shudder too. Because sure, sometimes the teachers we have at school can be stressful or even cruel, but other times it's not the teachers you need to worry about. It's the students, or perhaps one student in particular. Kick back, my friend, and let's make the most of this break before I have to clock back in and find more hair to restock those cookies. This is a tale from the break room. One of my students started stalking me. From Miss C. I want to begin by saying I've been a high school science teacher for only about three years now, and with graduating from high school and college early, I'm a bit closer in age to my students right now than most of the teachers at the school I work with. On one hand, this is a blessing. They're more willing to open up to me about problems. They don't fill nearly the same social gap due to the age difference, and I'm able to give them life advice that isn't just spouting impossibilities to them with how the economy is currently. But on the other hand, it can be difficult to get them to take me seriously. And while most of the class periods I teach have and do take me seriously, over the years I've been teaching, there's always one or two periods that are an uphill battle. Usually male, and sometimes even female students, make inappropriate comments about me, some of them never taking warning seriously. And the worst, oh the absolute worst, is when they think they can convince me to hang out with them outside of school. And no, I don't mean after school while I'm grading papers and running a study hall. I've had students request me to hang out with them outside of school. That's just too weird and inappropriate to hang out with a student. The only other quote-unquote disrespectful thing they do is call me by my first name. But I've personally never had too much of a problem with that. However, I do ask that they refer to me as Miss C, not my actual name. All in all, I do love my job, and I still do most days. However, this year has been hard since winter break finished up. To back up a bit, during the winter break, I had the all too awkward situation of running into one of my students at the mall. For privacy's sake, I'll call him Daniel. I noticed him before he noticed me and I prayed we weren't going to the same store. The last thing I needed was him trying to strike up a conversation like we were friends. A simple wave would have been fine, or even a, hi, Miss C. But judging by how little he respected me in class, something told me it wasn't going to go down like that. That, and I also didn't need my students finding out I frequented Hot Topic and Spencer's. But still, I had gone to the mall for a reason and I was going to do my shopping and not simply leave over something so small. I made my way over to Hot Topic, beginning to browse around, looking for the items and clothes I wanted to buy. It was while getting assistance with a shirt they had in the back that Daniel came into the shop. I tried my best to not be noticeable, tucking myself into a corner and keeping myself busy by looking over products I'd already looked at earlier. But as luck would have it, he approached me. Hi, Mrs. C. Daniel always called me Mrs. C. I'd reminded him tons of times I wasn't married, but he never seemed to listen or care. Oh, uh, hi, Daniel, I said as I turned around. How was your Christmas? He asked. It was good. I tried to sound polite. That's good. So what you shopping for? Oh, just returning some stuff and getting other stuff, I lied. Oh, so like Boxing Day? I guess, kinda, yeah. Around then, the person working retail brought me the shirt I wanted and walked over to the register with me. 
Well, nice seeing you, Daniel. See you at the start of the semester. After that awkward encounter, I then made a beeline for Spencer's so I could finish up my shopping and just get back home. I grabbed the stuff I needed for my New Year's party. Most of it was highly inappropriate. That's just the kind of sense of humor my friends and I have. Sure enough, as the cashier was bagging everything, Daniel was there again. Oh, hi again, Mrs. C, he said, cheerfully. Oh, hey again, Daniel, I said, doing my best to block from view what was in my bags. Funny to bump into you again. He shrugged in response. Uh, anyway, I'll see you around, Mrs. C. I sighed in relief. He seemed to have been as embarrassed as I was to bump into him again. But at the time, I didn't think too much into it. And for a bit, everything was calm. It was during my New Year's party, however, another odd occurrence happened. My friends and I were drinking, dancing, and singing karaoke. It was around midnight at that point, but the countdown hadn't started yet. My sister was prepping the fireworks we had bought, mostly just the less dangerous stuff, but stuff that's still fun to watch. Suddenly, a bright flame goes off in the yard. Most of us spin around to look at my sister afraid something had gone wrong, but she was just as confused as we were. Then she suddenly burst out laughing and pointed at me. Embarrassingly enough, turns out part of my dress had flipped up while I was dancing. I quickly covered myself back up and tried to laugh it off with everyone else. Once the laughing died down, we did try to figure out what that bright light was. If it wasn't a flame or a firework like I'd previously thought, then what was it? All the fireworks were still unlit after all. Nothing had malfunctioned. My sister said it actually looked more like someone had taken a picture but no one claimed to have done it after asking around. We chalked it up to someone else launching their fireworks early, though we weren't sure why we didn't hear the explosion afterwards, to which my best friend guessed it might have just been a dud. None of that really added up. Now, these events wouldn't have been a real issue before I got back to school. However, in the new light I see them in, they make me very uncomfortable. Back at school, Daniel began asking for extra help in class, claiming he was struggling, which was odd. For as disrespectful as he could be in class, he was a straight-A student in the first semester, but in the first week he had filled a quiz and hadn't turned anything in. At first, I was only annoyed and a bit disappointed, but once he began coming by after school every day for study hall, I found it even more odd. I figured maybe he got a crush on me, when I was younger, I remember having plenty of crushes on different teachers when I was in school, so I didn't put much weight into it. But I did try to avoid helping him one-on-one -on -one as much as possible, as I didn't want to confuse the kid in any way. Instead, I got some student aides or teaching assistants to help him, to make sure he stayed on track. But still, even with all the help he got, he continued to fail tests. Tests I knew he shouldn't have been failing, so he would continue to come in after class, asking for any help in studying. At the time, I was still just confused, but this would continue to get weirder and worse. Intermission End of intermission The next event happened on Valentine's Day. I'd gotten to work early. No special someone in my life, thank you very much, and found my room covered in paper hearts and Valentine's cards on my desk. I looked around, confused, but still brought all my stuff in. I wasn't sure why my class was all decorated like this, as I wasn't a very big Valentine's Day kind of person at all. Maybe the janitors had done it. I went to one of the rooms next to me and checked. The teacher was in there, Mrs. F, we'll call her. She had a normal plain Jane room, though. So they didn't set up hearts all over your room? I asked. She looked up from her papers, confused. Uh, why would they do that? I don't know. I was seeing if they only did it to mine. Does the staff or janitors normally set up decorations? I asked. Mm, no, she said, standing up. Let's have a look. She headed over to my room and I followed her. Once we opened the door, she looked around, stunned. This is... Gorgeous, but no, I don't think the janitors did this, unless one of them liked you. Does one of them like you? 
I thought back to the number of times I'd gotten into arguments with them over how messy some of my class's experiments were. I don't think they even platonically like me, Mrs. F. She frowned and looked around again. Well, do you want help taking it all down? Yeah, kind of, I responded. All right, I'm busy all day with Chapter 22's test, but tomorrow morning I'll be able to. Sound good? I nodded. Yeah, I don't think it'll hurt to be festive today anyway. I was just confused. Mrs. F agreed that it was weird, and I let her get back to grading or whatever it was she was working on. I started to set up everything for class that day when I remembered the card. It had a very well done drawing of me on the front. I gave it a weird look and then opened it, and what was written still creeps me out. It began with my first name and said, I feel we have started to grow closer, and I'm truly and utterly in love with you, and I know you're in love with me too. The way you look at me in class, the way you ask me to stay after, I know you ache to tell me how you feel, but aren't allowed to. It's okay. I know what you really mean. I think about you in my most private times, and I know you do too. I see your side glances you give me in class. You know. P.S. I have something to confess. I really enjoyed seeing you on New Year's. I was horrified with what I read. My mind immediately went to Daniel, which I knew may seem unfair, but he was the only regular in my study halls, the only one I had to speak to after class regularly about their grades. I was furious. I took the card over to my shredder and pressed it in and turned it on. For one, it was cathartic, and for two, I was nervous to bring it to the attention of the staff. Even if they did believe me, it still could have hindered my career. I finished setting up for my class and started my day. It went smoothly. However, the whole event caused me to feel nauseous and gross, especially when Daniel's class period came up. It passed by okay, but I felt weird and, well, icky the whole time, like I'd done something wrong when I hadn't. When I dismissed class, I called up everyone who was missing assignments, skipping Daniel. After reading that letter, I started to assume maybe he wasn't turning them in just so he could talk to me. I remember he didn't show up to my study hall that day, and if I'm being honest, it was a huge relief. I know it's my job as a teacher to help all students, but in my head, everything was just lining up. I had even come to the conclusion that the bright flash was Daniel taking a picture of me on New Year's Eve. Some of his weirder interactions in study hall that once felt dorky and awkward felt gross now in this new light. He and his friend blushing when I would look at them while scanning the classroom to make sure everyone was working. How I'd often find him behind me while I was going through supply closets or the classroom lap cupboards. Even the way he said my name gave me goosebumps now. Before this, I simply thought I was one of his favorite teachers, but now it felt as if I was still his favorite teacher in the worst possible way. Despite all of that, I didn't understand how he could have even found my house. I'm sure he could have just googled it somehow, but still, it felt wrong and gross to even come to that conclusion. While my students studied, I cleaned up some of the hearts and stuff, placing all of them directly into the shredder. One student, we'll call her Emily, who was always kind and respectful, though a bit behind in class, questioned what I was doing. Miss C? I didn't look to respond. I remember just watching the hearts get shredded, and waves of relief watching over me with each one. Yes, Emily? I questioned back. Why are you shredding all the hearts? Didn't you spend hours on those? I shrugged. I'm not a big fan of Valentine's Day. This was for you guys to enjoy. Make school a bit more special, you know? I said, completely avoiding the actual question. Oh, okay. She said and got back to her late work. The next morning, it took me and Mrs. F an hour to clear up everything. Glitter, more paper hearts, streamers. Honestly, seeing how much there was made me sick. When did this person find the time to do this? How would they have gotten in here without me or someone knowing? I remember discussing this with Mrs. F, wondering what I should do. She shared my same sentiments of just trying to ignore it. 
I never let her know that I thought it was a student, instead sticking to the janitor story. But she was still worried if people started saying it was a student. In the past, our school has had a few cases where teachers were less than appropriate with students. The school board was getting jumpy, she said, and I agreed, though I didn't really know as well as her, having been there for such a short time and all. But I usually agreed with most things Mrs. F. said. She had taken me under her wing. Heck, she was even the teacher I assisted to get some of my college credits. So, you ever seen anything like this? I asked. Not unless another teacher did it, no, she replied. I remember there was a pause. It felt like forever. Most of my time at school was feeling that way now, unsafe. Eventually, Mrs. F. began again. If you want, I can walk you to your car after study hall. You seem a bit anxious about all this. Thanks. Yes, I, I am. I sat on the brink of tears. It'll be okay, sweetie. She hugged me as I cried. You gonna be okay to teach today? I nodded. Since then, Mrs. F. has walked me to my car after work, and in all of this, she was a good friend supporting me. The next few days after that were horrible, if I remember correctly. At least, during Daniel's period. He was loud, disruptive, disrespectful, but I just took the abuse, and at the end of every class I made sure to simply let him leave. This behavior had confirmed it in my mind that it was him, so I was fine with letting his grade drop to a D. It was his fault to begin with. It was either that weekend or the next that some strange occurrences happened at home. Both weekends, I felt a very strong feeling of being watched, and on one of these occasions, I wish I could remember which, I kept hearing tapping at my windows and rustling in the bushes outside my house. Every time I went to investigate, I didn't go farther than my small porch, really just a small slab of concrete, but I don't know what else to call it. Eventually, I gave up looking, though, and just dealt with those noises. That was the only weekend where it happened both days. But since then, and sometimes on the Fridays after school, too, I'll hear those noises again. It drove me crazy. But again, I don't know what I could do. Even if I did call the police, whoever it was, they would probably flee before they could do anything. The worst of the stuff at home, though, has been the random love letters outside my front door and sometimes my back door, each making me sick. Here's what some of them said, all of which used my first name. You've started to give me the cold shoulder, but that's okay. I get it. You enjoy playing games. I enjoy them too. Playing hard to get is so hot. Please keep it up. It makes your classes that much better for me. Signed, you know who I am, right? This confirmed that it was definitely a student who was writing these. It actually said a bit more, but it makes me sick even thinking what else that one said. Here's the next one. I loved what you wore for Spirit Week. Those streaks of green face paint make me wonder what you'd look like in body paint. Maybe you can show me sometime. Maybe once you're done playing hard to get. It's still fun for me, too. But it's also starting to get old, Maybe we can spice things up in another way. I don't consider myself someone with a weak stomach, but this one did me in. I actually vomited from reading it. It was wrong in so many ways. The next one. I've had enough games. I'll be over tonight. Just leave the door unlocked for me, okay? Just like you promised me. This freaked me out a bit because I hadn't even spoken to this kid in a month, and here he was making up stories about me. It'll be great to see you tonight, even if you don't see me. This one was signed by your favorite student and ended up leading to one of the creepiest nights of my life. The whole time I was afraid of every creak and thud, nervous that this kid was going to pop out of anywhere. I eventually passed out on my couch, clutching my baseball bat my dad had given me. Not sure if I would have been able to use it. Daniel was still a kid, only 16. But I don't know. I don't know if I even could have. I don't think I have it in me to actively harm this kid. Well, at least then. Now, maybe, but still, I don't know. Intermission
End of intermission. It took me a bit, but eventually I worked up the courage to take these letters to Mrs. F. She was immediately concerned, but still the same as me, not knowing what to do. She knew if I reported it to the police, they would be involved and they would get him away from me, sure, but we both knew all it would take was a single rumor and I'd never get to work in this school district again. I figured it might stop and I didn't want to lose my job, let alone become blacklisted, possibly in the whole city, or worse, the entire state, over being a victim. I distinctly remember that it was that same day I had to cancel study hall so that I could go shopping for some important items I needed. Most of the students, especially the ones who originally had a mandatory study hall, were excited about this. However, a few others seemed displeased. At the end of the school day, I locked up my room early. However, I noticed a line notebook sitting on the floor next to one of the desks. If study hall had been in session, I would have easily missed it, what with backpacks and notes being a mess everywhere usually. I walked over to my classroom's lost and found basket when a picture fell from the notebook. A Polaroid. It was a picture of me, of the wardrobe malfunction at the New Year's Eve party. I crumpled it and shoved it into my pocket, flipping open the notebook. Sure enough, at the top of the pages for in-class work was Daniel's heading. I stormed out, throwing the notebook at the lost and found basket, and left. I double-checked the locks. I had been right. I knew all along, but I definitely knew now. I raced to the store, and sure enough, a few minutes in, there he was. I have no clue how he found the location I was going to, but I felt sick. Hi, Mrs. C, he said in a cheerful voice. I ignored him, though, walking past and slipping AirPods in once I was out of sight. If he saw me again, I'd have an alibi to ignore him. That was apparently a mistake. Every time after that that I went grocery shopping, he would be there. No matter the time of day, no matter the day of the week, he seemed to always be there if I was. Even when I went to different locations or different stores, I tried to keep an eye out for his car or at least a car that may have been following me whenever I'd leave, but whether from home or work, I never did figure out how he was doing it. Eventually, I just stopped going, asking my sister to pick up groceries for me. The creepy noises outside my house, especially the tapping on the windows, only got worse and worse at that point. But of course, it couldn't end there. No, because I found messages in Sharpie written on the windows too, calling me sweetie and lover, telling me what he wants to do to me, how I make him feel, crude drawings of me. It all makes me very sick. But still, after all of this, I was too terrified to tell the school what was happening. How could I? Teachers have been blacklisted and fired for students talking too positively about them in my state. I couldn't imagine what they'd call me and claimed I did, or what he'd claim I did to him if it did go to court. And come time for prom, what happened every year happened this year too. Multiple students every year so far without fail try to ask me to prom. Usually, it's the popular kids, the football stars or cheerleaders who think everyone in the world has the hots for them. I would usually laugh, tease them a bit about it, then tell them that whoever they find to go with will be lucky. I don't want to shut them down horribly. They're just kids after all. But this year, besides the ones I'd come to expect, of course, Daniel asked me too. He had brought balloons and a bouquet of flowers. At first, I thought it was his birthday, but no, they were presents for me. I faked being happy to get them, and I did my whole let them down gently thing as I usually did. But the look in his eye told me everything. Instead of embarrassed or disappointed, he looked mad. He was holding it back, but I could tell. I made him take the balloons and everything with him, and told him to find a nice girl his age to ask. I remember him protesting that I wasn't much older than him, to which I shot back that I still wouldn't go to prom with a student as that was just wrong. The class laughed at that, which probably added fuel to the fire. I admit I didn't handle the situation as best I could, but it did feel good to have some sort of revenge, even if to my class it just made me a savage and a girl boss for the next few weeks. 
One horrible night also sticks out while I'm writing this. It was a Saturday night. I'm practically completely out of teacher mode by then and was scrolling through Snapchat, sending pictures to friends and seeing what exciting lives they had while I was just a high school teacher. Most of them were still in college, so most of the pictures were of wild parties and stacks of homework. But that's when I got a text from a hidden number. Someone was sending me dozens of pictures, maybe hundreds. I didn't look through all of them, only glancing at the ones that caught my eye in the most horrific ways. Mostly pictures of my house. But there were also pictures of me through the window, at the pool with friends, one of me showering in the gym. I scrolled in horror, my heart racing, and I felt that all-too-familiar feeling of being watched. I looked around at all these slits the curtains didn't cover. It felt like the room was spinning, that I was being watched from every corner. I felt dizzy, top-heavy. I dropped my phone and the screen cracked all over, but I didn't notice that till morning. Every window was looking at me, watching me, my every move, and even though I knew he couldn't be at every window at once, I couldn't help but feel like I was an animal at a zoo. Then I wanted to sleep. I was suddenly very tired, and my stomach hurt, like it did that time I read one of his love letters. I couldn't bring myself to sleep in my room, as it too had a window. So I ran while Moore stumbled into the bathroom, with the pillow in my hand, and I slammed it shut. I cried myself to sleep that night on the cold tile floor, wrapped in towels, my head upon an uncomfortable couch pillow. I remember the dream or nightmare I had. A vivid one of Daniel finding a way in, trying to bust down my bathroom door, him holding a hammer, calling me terrible things, and threatening me with even worse things. One of the worst dreams I've had in my entire life, and I'm not ashamed to admit how scared I was to open the bathroom door after that dream come morning. I also remember finding my phone on the floor. That unknown number had sent dozens of inappropriate pictures of themselves. I deleted all of them, every picture of me and them. No more texts ever came from it, but it felt as if I was being taunted, that he was telling me how easy it was for him to watch me and to get me in vulnerable positions. I didn't leave the house except to go to work after this. It wasn't just no more trips to the grocery store, it was now no more leaving the house or my classroom. I was worried this would never end, until I had a brilliant idea. And while this wouldn't solve my current situation, it would hopefully get him out of my hair forever. Instead of barely passing him and giving him a D, instead I looked through his grades overall. Straight A's all four years, so I recently bumped him up to an A. I knew from when the faculty asked us to discuss universities that he wanted to go abroad or to some fancy school. I don't remember exactly which, but it was definitely out of state. Making sure he had a 4.0 would get him away from me. And, sure enough, since I was technically his home room, I was able to hand out acceptance letters to students for college, and when I placed a stack on Daniel's desk, I couldn't help but feel happy. Not for him, but for myself. That maybe this nightmare would finally be over soon. So for now, I just have to wait a little bit longer at the time of writing this. He's been bragging all about the college he's going to. Though the creepy stuff hasn't stopped, I know it will once he's gone. Once he states away, I'll be free to enjoy being a teacher again. After summer, of course. As a teacher, I want to try to find a lesson in all of this. But I can't. I've become a bit more strict because of it as it gave me more stability to my life in a time when I desperately needed it. But I still didn't do anything to cause this. All I can say is that horrible people are out there, and sometimes you can't tell who they are until it's too late. If you're a teacher or someone residing over kids, don't be fooled. Even teenagers can hide certain evils, Always be on your guard, because the moment your guard is down, predators strike. Even those that have not fully matured are capable of terrible things. Oh boy, time to clock back in. Well, it's been fun chatting with you. I'll see you again real soon.
with more Tales from the Break Room. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Uh, customers are beginning to pile in, but it's my coffee break, so not my problem just yet. Hey there. You know, the worst part about work isn't how boring it can be or how difficult it might get. No, if you ask me, it's the customers. Sure, most of them are polite or quiet, but once in a blue moon, you get that customer who doesn't seem quite right. And when you approach to greet them with a warm smile, the only warmth you feel in return is your own blood flowing from your throat. You didn't see the man's knife. You didn't know just how unhinged he was. You were simply working through another hour to make sure your family can keep a roof over their heads. Mm, that's the real horror, if you ask me. Oh, who am I? Just the closing shift manager of a cozy little coffee shop on the outskirts of town called Dead and Roasted. Working here for so long, I've got loads of stories to share with you. Stories from workers of every variety, experiencing allegedly real horror on and around the job. I hope you're ready to be scared. Because when you clock in, you may never clock out. These are tales from the break room. Mr. Kindling Man from Chrissy. There's no climax to the story, no being followed or anything like that. But this was a conversation I will not forget, and I still share it from time to time as one of my creepiest work stories. It was the fall of 2019. I started a job in a local crafts store that was right around the corner of my college campus. I was in the wood craft section with my section partner, Michelle. Note that our store was rather large and we had to use a large movable stairway that was only five to six steps tall. From it, I could see all the way to the front of the store where the registers were, but people couldn't see me very well, not unless I made a big enough effort to be seen. I was moving products from the very top to the bottom, handing them to Michelle. At some point, she gets paged up front for a price check, and I'm left alone. Not two minutes go by, I'm at the very top of the staircase and I have my foot kind of dangling off because I was reaching for a wood crate. Suddenly, this old man comes up. He appears to be in his 60s. He's got a dark coat, shaggy gray hair, and smelled of old eggs, if I'm going to be honest. Right away, without a word, he just grabs a hold of my ankle and hard. I kind of winced and jumped because he had scared me. I looked at him asking him what was up and if I could help him. He looked at me dead in the eye and said, You know, most of these wood items would make great kindling, and so would your ankle. I was shocked. Like, why would you possibly say that, of all things? Not only that, but I was stuck on this staircase with no exit. If I tried to run, he might hurt me but he also had a very firm grip of my ankle with his dirty, oil-covered hands. I quickly snapped back and whipped my foot back over his wrist. He let go, chuckling. <laughs> At that moment, I proceeded to wave and call out for Michelle, trying to be as calm as possible. I said a customer had a question that I couldn't answer. By the time she got over there, the man was gone and I didn't see him in the store. I told Michelle what happened. She told me to go take a break so I could calm down, which I happily did, and I finished out my shift with no further issues. Whatever that dude's problem was, I hope he isn't using fire to deal with it. Dancing in Death From Princess Marlena Many years ago, in a city I can't disclose, I performed as a dancer at a very old theater. I'd sometimes spend the night in the theater to avoid commuting, as the neighborhood in which the theater was located was very dangerous, especially after dark. Eventually, I decided to move into the theater, 
as rent was increasing and my relationship with my roommates was becoming tense. I packed my things and discreetly moved into the theater. This theater had showers and there was a staff kitchen. I was very careful not to make a mess or overstock the fridge or freezer. There was a small convenience store that could supply me. I practically lived there. It saved me on rent money as the local apartments were costly. One night, as I slept on an old twin folding cot left forgotten in a small storage room, I heard what sounded like gentle footsteps. They were padding down the hallways, passing my little hiding spot just outside the door. I would hear this often, waking me up from an otherwise sound sleep. We didn't have security guards, and the cleaning staff would go home after certain hours. I knew when the administrative staff came and went, and this wasn't them. I would hear footsteps in the back rehearsal area of the theater, especially the dance rooms. The bars would occasionally rattle or shift. I even heard dance steps on the stage. I recognized the patterns as ballet dance steps. I wanted to tell someone, but I didn't want to get into trouble for squatting in the theater. This activity continued and even increased for me. Then again, maybe it's because I noticed it more often. One night I snuck up into the dressing room backstage to retrieve something I'd forgotten in my locker after dance theater rehearsal. Upon unlocking my locker and retrieving the item, someone pushed the locker door closed right there in front of me. That someone was a ballerina. She was dressed in a leotard, tights, leg warmers, and ballet shoes. She looked like she had just come from rehearsal. She gave me this blank, cold stare, and I stared back in shock. No one else was supposed to be there in the theater at that time except for me. I gasped. Frantically, I spoke. You're the one I've been hearing around here. The girl smiled but faded from sight like a shadow until she was gone. I couldn't believe it. I locked the locker and made my way back to my hiding spot. Since then, I swear I could still hear her in the theater from time to time. I even saw her practicing her dancing either in the back rehearsal dance room of the theater or even on the stage. Whether the stage curtains were drawn or down, parted or raised, we had both vertical and horizontal operating curtains. I think she eventually found my hiding spot as I would hear her tapping gently on my door. We sort of had an understanding, I think. I left her alone and she left me alone. On those rare occasions where I'd see her, I would stare or glance, but when I occasionally spoke to her, she would either just nod or shake her head. She never stayed in sight for long, nor would I hear her dancing for long. I never actively sought her out. It was like stumbling upon a deer in the woods. She may have even helped me out by alerting me from time to time if someone was coming, be it someone in the staff returning for something or a surprise visit from someone on the board of trustees for the theater. Eventually, the performance season ended and I was able to afford an apartment. Not to mention, I managed to land another performance gig at a different theater across town. The day I was packing up my things and moving out, I saw something written in the dust on the floor of the storage room. It read, Goodbye and break a leg. It hadn't been there before. I wrote, thank you, in reply and left. Now that I performed at a new theater, in my free time I looked up the history of that old theater at the library. I found an old news story on microfiche dating back many years ago. It was about a ballet dancer who had died in the theater. She had apparently overdosed on a dangerous and experimental diet drug that had led her to her death. She collapsed dead after curtain call of the final season's performance. It was a shame. I saw her photo and it turned out she looked exactly like the woman I'd seen at that old theater, haunting the place. I'll never forget this encounter, but I rarely share the story of this experience 
since I doubt anyone would believe me. And even if they do, I don't want them going to look for the theater and for that ghost. I just don't want people to bother her. I never went back, so I don't know if she's still there or not. But I wish her well, and I hope she finds peace. Murder on the Loose From James I'm from the UK, and I work at a restaurant. I think this happened about two years ago. On that particular day, it was extremely quiet. I was doing some dishes in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, I heard a lot of voices in the restaurant. I went to see what was up, and the staff that was out there seemed all shaken up and worried. From the back of the restaurant windows, you could see into the beer garden. The staff said they saw a guy covered in blood holding a knife. Apparently, he had climbed and jumped over the beer garden fence. It looked as if he was fleeing from something. We later heard on the news a day or two later that there had been a murder in the area right near us. The guy who had done it was still on the loose. They said he was on drugs or something. I didn't see it, like I said, but just hearing about that really freaked me out. After all, we were all vulnerable, and anything could have happened. Luckily, he was caught and put away, but it goes to show you how you need to be careful all the time. That guy could have broken in, and God knows what could have happened. I remember a time on a Friday night about a year ago, when I was on shift at work. It was just a normal day. Nothing happened. We were just closing down as usual in the evening. My manager, Dan, came running down the stairs into the kitchen. He told us to lock all the doors and to keep a good lookout. That was scary, because you could just see how panicked Dan was. In the bar, a man who was completely intoxicated began to get violent, throwing glass bottles around at the staff. All the girls working on the bar that night were crying and terrified. This drunk guy had gone on a rampage around the pub, and no one knew where he was. They found him eventually and kicked him out, and he was arrested. I can't understand why people get drunk and suddenly get so violent. We've had some really tough and scary experiences at work. Something at the Daycare From Sweet Tooth 101 Growing up, I believe I experienced multiple instances of paranormal activity. But what I experienced one night at my first job was genuinely one of the most unnerving things to ever happen to me. It was about 15 years ago. I worked my first job right out of high school in childcare. Just to give you an idea, it was a small, privately owned daycare with only about six or seven employees. Before the daycare was built, there was apparently a house and a junkyard on the property. And the rumor among the staff was the original owner of the property had died in the house, which was later demolished. One night, a lady that I'll call Amy and I were closing up. Her boyfriend came by to pick her up, and she asked me if I would be okay by myself if she went ahead and left. I told her, yeah, I'd be fine, as I was almost finished cleaning. I finished vacuuming and watched through the window as they drove off. A moment after that, I turned the vacuum cleaner off, and all of a sudden, I heard the bathroom door slam shut. And I mean this thing slammed. The light and fan also came on in the bathroom about a second later. My initial thought was that maybe there was a child there trying to play a joke. But Amy always checked off a list of names as parents came to get their kids and she checked every possible hiding place before leaving. I quickly put the vacuum cleaner away in the kitchen, and I started to head towards the bathroom. You know that feeling of dread you get when you feel as if you're about to do something scary or dangerous? That sinking feeling in your chest and stomach? Yeah, I full on felt that. I quickly opened the bathroom door, turned off the light and fan, and I kid you not, from behind the door, I heard what I could only describe as an angry huff and a snarl. 
I should also mention that I felt a strange, almost tangible presence in that bathroom. And no, there were no kids hiding in the bathroom. There was only about eight inches of space between the door and the wall when I opened it, so there wasn't any room for anyone to hide. I locked up for the night and left. I swear I felt something watching me as I was leaving. When I came back to work a couple of days later, I went back into the bathroom, closed the door, turned on the light and fan, just to see if it could have possibly been the fan making that snarling, huffing sound. I turned it on and off a couple of times and no sound. I told Amy about it. She said she wasn't surprised. She had worked there a few years before and had experienced some odd activity herself. She said that one day she heard chairs moving in the toddler room when all the kids were out in the main room. I should also mention that several months before my encounter, I was talking with another lady who worked there. She said they had been there on a closed day, wrapping Christmas presents for the kids and listening to Christmas music. She said that all of a sudden, the door to the toddler room just slammed shut. The radio station changed by itself too. One of the other ladies started to head over to the radio to change the station back, but it quickly turned back on its own. I worked overnight security for a Fortune 500 company. From Darkness. Let me start by saying I'm writing this because I worked four years for a corporation that is very well known in the industry. They make a product that everyone has heard about and is extremely overpriced. It began the first day I began training for my job as an overnight security officer. My trainer began walking me through the four-story, two-winged corporate headquarters. The reason I started at this point is because of the random event that happened in the first hour. While showing me through the building, we came to the marketing department's area on the third floor. The trainer was showing me some of the company's advertisements. One caught my eye because the model in the advertisement was a former college roommate and close friend of mine. We'd gone to school together at the other end of the state, so to see him in an ad at my new job shocked me beyond belief. A week later, when meeting a senior vice president of the company, she kept looking at me with scrunched eyes. When I finally asked her if something was wrong, she mentioned I looked like a former member of her church from her hometown, where she'd lived until 1998. I asked what town it was. She said the same name of the town I grew up in. I was shocked once again at the coincidence. I told her that's where I grew up. I had just moved to this new city six months prior. She asked me if I knew a man and dropped my father's name. I went wide-eyed and told her that was my dad. This woman had been on the church's trustee board with my father for years. We were 300 miles from that town and 13 years had passed since she had moved. Just another random coincidence, but weird. A couple of weeks after that, a coworker of mine asked me how the night shift was going. I explained to him it was fine, except for two areas in the building, which gave me the creeps. Those areas were the hallway for the human resources department, which gave me the odd sense that I was always being watched when I was in that area, and the executive meeting room, which gave off similar vibes. The coworker laughed and said it was just because the lights were off when I walked through those areas and that I'd get used to it. About a week after that, the site supervisor called me one evening, asking me to come to work for a meeting. I figured I was losing my job as I had just started and was afraid I wasn't working up to their expectations. Color me surprised when I was walked into the client supervisor's office and given a non-disclosure agreement to sign. When I asked what this was about, he and my direct supervisor told me I had to sign it to find out everything. Reluctantly, I signed the paper. I was told it would be binding for seven years. It was then explained to me that corporate security had been informed I was feeling uncomfortable in two specific places in the building. These locations happened to be spots where someone had died during construction of the office building the company was in. It was explained to me that certain members of the executive staff believed in the paranormal 
and had the lawyers draft up the NDA so rumors of paranormal activity didn't spread and ruin the company's reputation. Another shocking moment for me at this job. I was also informed that the security cameras caught things on a regular basis. In fact, the supervisor showed me a few clips of office furniture moving on its own at night. There was a chair swiveling when no one was around, a door to the emergency exit stairwell opening with no one there. I was told if I caught anything like this, or saw it in person, I was to report it to the security supervisor so it could be saved for their documentation. I would later find out the company was moving to a new location and was using this collected evidence to show the landlord what was happening in the building. Over the next year, many events happened, from seeing shadows on the cameras in the break rooms to seeing black mass orbs scurrying around the legal department's area while walking my assigned tours. The worst event at that site happened on the 4th of July in 2012. I was finishing a tour through the HR hallway when I heard a woman scream. I was alone in the building, so I freaked out. The lights were on in the area and no one was around. I noped out of that area, texting my supervisor about what happened. He responded that I was to remain at the security desk for the rest of the night and to ignore my security patrols, that he would be at the work site at 7 a.m. to talk to me. For the next three hours, I sat in the security room, freaking out because it was so loud. It sounded like someone was being hurt. When my supervisor showed up, he told me he was shocked I had gone almost seven months before I heard anything like this. He apologized for not warning me ahead of time. He said usually other security guards heard whispers or voices, but a couple of guys had also heard screaming and yelling. The next major incident happened when I was asked to cover a shift at the company's plane hangar at the local airport. It was my first night there, and I was given a rundown of my patrol tasks. One task was to restock the employee soda fridge so the air crew had cold soda when they came to work. The fridge was located in a small storage room next to the security office. The first night I refilled the fridge from soda boxes that were stacked on a shelf in the room. I restocked the fridge and left the room. As soon as I closed the door, I heard a loud bang coming from it. Thinking I might have banged into something on my way out, I opened the door to investigate. I found a can of Coke lying on the ground behind the door. The issue was all the cans were either in the fridge or on the shelf at the opposite end of the room 10 feet away. There was no way a can was randomly flying 10 feet from a shelf. I told my relief about the incident in the morning. He laughed and told me I had just met the resident ghost. Apparently, I didn't fill the fridge with enough coke and that's why the can was thrown at the door. The last two major incidents happened two days in a row at the site of the new corporate headquarters. The new building was built between 2012 and 2014. During construction, all the other guards swore the new building was even more haunted than the last. They claimed they heard footsteps and voices when no one was around. I never personally witnessed this, as I was stationed in the security car while the building was being built. But once it was completed, I had my worst experience to date. The first thing happened while on security patrol on a Sunday afternoon. I was on the phone with my mother as I walked through the building. When I got to a group of cubicles in the purchasing department, I was startled by a calendar page being flipped aggressively as I walked past. I jumped and shouted out of being scared by the event. I went over to the cubicle where the event occurred and could not find anyone else in the area. My mother had even heard the paper rustle and me screaming. She freaked out because she had never heard me yell like that before. The final event happened the next day. I was walking by the same desk in purchasing. I was vigilant this time so I wouldn't be scared again, or so I hoped. This time, however, it was not a random item being moved. I turned a corner, and I was greeted by a partially formed apparition standing in a doorway. I absolutely jumped out of my skin and ran down to the security office to report the incident. 
The other guard rewound the security footage of me and saw a quick glimpse of me jumping as I turned the corner. Another camera angle showed the apparition that I'd seen. I quit that day. I was tired of being scared at my own job, and no amount of anything was going to keep me there. Pretty creepy, right? Seems like if your job isn't haunted by restless spirits, it's haunted by the creepiest sorts of customers, or even co-workers. Well, it's time for me to clock back in. Those rigor mortis lattes aren't gonna make themselves. I'll see you again on my next break with more tales from the break room. Until then, try to survive your next shift. Tales from the Break Room is part of the EerieCast Network. It's hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him at Dark Prevails on Twitter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. To have your scariest workplace experiences told on the show, send them to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. Starting April 14th, 2022, we're now paying three cents per word for stories that make it onto the show for a limited time and PayPal only. EerieCast is a horror podcast network. For more scary stories and unsettling podcasts, go to eeriecast.com.